Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I have the great pleasure of being joined by my colleague, Dr. Omar Abu Ezzedin, expert in uh, circulatory failure, as well as imaging, as well as uh, cardiac sarcoid and amyloidosis. Omar, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Dr. Friedman. Um, I want to change gears and talk a little bit about a different condition uh, that, I, that you're also very expert in and uh, have cared for a lot of patients with, and that's amyloidosis and specifically amyloid heart disease. And I'm going to focus on the imaging role, the nuclear imaging role, but maybe before we dive into that, it may make sense to just very briefly review with our listeners symptoms, key findings, you know, when to, to suspect cardiac amyloid and, and maybe populations that are emerging that seem to have an increased risk, TAV or AFib, et cetera. Thanks for that question. Absolutely. Um, amyloid is, we've had a, you know, a revolution, if you want, in the diagnosis of amyloid in the last uh, few years. Um, just to break it down first, there's two types of main amyloid that infiltrate the heart muscle. There's AL or light chain amyloidosis, and that's more of a hematologic malignancy where you have a plasma proliferative plasma uh, cell uh, process that that causes these light chains to be spewed out and that they infiltrate the myocardium. Um, and in TTR or transthyretin amyloid, you have a misfolded protein, which is the transthyretin, the transporter of thyroxine and retinal protein, which is ubiquitous, we all have it, but either because of a genetic reason or a hereditary reason, or because of age, we believe, um, uh, misfold. And when it does, this protein, which is a tetramer, becomes unstable, breaks down to monomers, and then those monomers form fibrils that infiltrate the myocardium. So in both cases, you have infiltration of the myocardium, as well as myocardial toxicity action in both cases. So it's a toxic inflammatory, uh, it's a toxic infiltrative, sorry, process mm -hmm. of infiltration. Now, the reason that's important is um, uh, when it comes to nuclear imaging, um, we have found that certain bone tracers, these are old tracers that existed since the 80s. Um, they're technetium-based bone tracers. Once you image, we have found uh, that uh, because these tracers target microcalcifications, we think, um, an indolent process such as infiltration of the myocardium and chronic, if you want, toxicity or chronic infiltration causes some microcalcification and scarring, which this radio tracer, this technetium based radio tracer, DPD in Europe, uh, here in the States, we use pyrophosphate, technetium pyrophosphate or PYP, uh, is able to detect specifically TTR cardiac amyloid or transthyretin cardiac amyloid. Now, um, this modality, before we you know, uh, ensure that the diagnosis is TTR, we have to make sure that AL amyloid has been ruled out. Because AL amyloid, whilst, uh, you know, it, while TTR is, is uh, you know, I, I equated them to each other as toxic infiltrative cardiomyopathies, AL amyloid is a medical emergency. It's a malignancy median survival 12 months to, eight, to 18 months. And so if you, you, when you're considering a diagnosis of amyloid, no matter what you're thinking about, the first, second, and third thing you need to rule out is light chain amyloid. And once you've done that, in the presence of technetium pyrophosphate or DPD uptake of the myocardium, we believe, and uh, there's strong data supporting this, seminal papers, in fact, have shown that the positive predictive value of technetium pyrophosphate uptake after you've ruled out light chain disease approaches 100%. Essentially, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, making endomyocardial biopsy, um, uh, I don't want to say obsolete because we still use it in certain circumstances, but no longer is it the rule, rather the exception. So now with diagnosis, we really focus on PYP imaging, ruling out a, mono, a clonal process, light chain process. Uh, and once you've ruled the, the AL out and you have a positive scan, which uh, is defined as um, uptake that's equal to or greater than the bone 
scan, uh, the bone uptake, mm-hmm. uh, that really uh, increases your confidence in this uh, diagnosis. Um, it is really remarkable, uh, and it's uh, great to see that we can move beyond biopsy. That and that increased specificity is really stunning in the clinical context, as, as you described it. Now, with the wide availability of PYP imaging, um, it almost sounds too good to be true. What are the limitations and drawbacks? And uh, what are the risks of false positives and false negative studies? Yeah. And, you know, like any modality, once you use it, you learn more about it, more so than you ever knew. So the first thing that, you know, I I need to emphasize, because um, uh, PYP imaging, it's it's, we call it scintigraphy. Uh, And typically, uh, two sets of images are obtained. A planar image, which is more like a 2D uh, uh, projection or 2D uh, image, that captures any myocardial activity. And there are certain uh, quantification methods where we normalize it to the contralateral lung field. Mm -hmm. And if that's above a certain ratio, uh, at three hours imaging, it's 1.3, at one hour imaging, it's 1.5, then that is very um, uh, suggestive of a diagnosis. But what we have found is that planar imaging is not enough. And around the country, there's an increased use of this technology, but not everyone, but but a lot of people are just doing planar imaging. And the reason it's not enough is because we have noted that there are cases where the uptake that you are seeing is in fact blood pool. And you need better spatial resolution, which you get with SPECT imaging, and particularly with SPECT CT imaging, which is what we do here at Mayo, to really localize that uptake that you see to the myocardia rather than the blood pool. And, um, and so we have, uh, in the nuclear community, have been really uh, uh, loudly uh, emphasizing that it's extremely important that SPECT or SPECT-CT imaging is obtained in addition to planar imaging to ensure that what we are seeing is, in fact, myocardial in nature. Uh, because we have seen cases where a diagnosis is made just based on the 2D planar image. Mm. When they come here, uh, you know, uh, for uh, for a second opinion, we find is in fact actually blood pool image uh, imaging uh, uptake, not uh, myocardium. So that's one uh, example of a false positive uh, condition. Other false positive conditions include recent myocardial infarction. In fact, this radio tracer was used historically uh, mm-hmm. to assess for myocardial infarction. So if someone has had an MI within four weeks or so, particularly in a coronary distribution, uptake in a coronary distribution, you should be very suspicious that this is actually coronary disease rather than infiltration with uh, amyloid. Um, Other uh, limitations, uh, which uh, planar imaging sort of uh, is, uh, falls uh, a victim to, if you want, is rib fractures, annular calcifications, anything on the 2D um, uh, image, which takes up this radio tracer, you know, anything, uh, calcified pulmonary nodules, for example, annular calcifications, things like this could falsely elevate your H to CL ratio on planar imaging and cause a false positive. What about uh, limitations? Uh, so assuming you have a SPECT image, uh, two questions there. One is limitations of, of that more comprehensive 3D. So you really have a better sense of where the activity is coming from. And then maybe comments on the pros and cons of hybrid spec CT versus spec alone imaging. Sure. So you see the limitations of spec is, um, and this modality in general, is we don't know yet what disease burden is needed mm. to capture a signal. And this sort of talks about the false negatives. You know, is it early disease? Uh, is it a certain? We now know there are certain fibrils uh, that of TTR amyloid that are different than others. So there's type A versus type B, and those type B fibrils uh, tend to infiltrate in a very organized fashion and not cause this uh, this uh, this uh, PYP signal to be positive. So uh, these are these are limitations, if you want, of SPECT imaging. Now, more importantly, the difficulty that we are finding with SPECT imaging on its own is the spatial resolution, particularly without uh, uh, attenuation correction. 
Um, and so with when we do CT, that gives us a really uh, good um, um, spatial resolution where you can, in fact, see where the signal is in the myocardium itself. Um, compared to if you didn't do CT, you, you think that that's the, um, that's the uh, myocardium, but there's not, no, no um, uh, obviously you don't have CT image to confirm that. And that's why we believe here at Mayo and at other uh, you know, reputable institutions that um, CT imaging is very helpful in the diagnosis. Uh, particularly in those difficult cases where you're not sure, is it in the blood pool? Is it in the subendocardium? Where exactly is this uptake? And that's all done in one hybrid scanner then? Correct. It's the whole image, so it's all registered together and you really know where things are. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now tell me about the role of PYP imaging to assess therapeutic response. As, as we have a lot of new treatments, obviously emerging for amyloid, really fundamentally changing the implications of that diagnosis. Um, uh, is this a useful tool for knowing how well these treatments are working? I would say no, um, based on the limited data we have. I mean, um, a serial imaging, regardless of therapy, has been shown not to be helpful. Uh, there's small studies that have looked at images uh, within 18 months of each other from the Columbia group, for example and also more recently uh, from a group in London, um, which has shown that really um, there's a lot of A, variability in imaging between the two uh, images, um, baseline and follow-up. And also uh, the Columbia group has shown that it doesn't really change that much. So you have, hmm. so it's really not very helpful, I think, when you have those underlying uh, difficulties when you throw in a therapy uh, because you don't know if it's the variability of the imaging uh, modality versus uh, treatment response. So unfortunately, because we can't capture the burden of disease, if you want, with PYP imaging, uh, I don't think that it's uh, we're there yet for uh, monitoring therapeutic response. There are other nuclear modalities that are up and coming, uh, such as PET imaging, um, uh, PET imaging of amyloid fibrils, which is more direct amyloid targeted, amyloid fibril tar targeted, which does give us an idea of burden. It's not FDA approved for myocardial imaging, it's FDA approved for, for brain imaging, but I think the future is moving in, in that direction of PET imaging for assessment of therapeutic response, as you had um, mentioned. Yeah, well, uh, Omar, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating space and really remarkable. It's almost Star Trek-like where you hold the tricorder over the patient. Now, these are bigger machines, but it's that, that non-invasive diagnosis uh, of what had required biopsies. It's, it's huge. Absolutely. It's so important. And we look forward to continued advance in the field. Thank you for taking the time to discuss it with me today. Thanks, Dr. Frieden. A pleasure being with you.